training. The main ingredients of sensitivity training are self-criticism and self-confession of personal feelings and behavior. Group criticism is aimed at changing individual behavioral patterns, in other words, moral concepts. Or, in the words of the National Training Laboratories and the National Education Association, it is called thought reform or brainwashing. Feelings are stressed almost exclusively, and reason and logic are ignored for sexual, emotional, and animalistic type responses. Sensitivity training strives to create a gut emotion over mind. To do this, the psychodrama is sometimes used so the participants can act out their roles of parent, hummingbird, cat, or whatever the group might wish him or her to be. To further heighten the anti-intellectual emotion over mind response, self-awareness is used. Feeling therapy, nude therapy, marathon therapy, nude bathing, and other group remedies are prescribed as a cure for all of society's ills. One of these emotional binges is called under the blanket, where participants are told to go under the blanket and remain quiet for five minutes. Then, without talking, they are to encounter one another. They are instructed to allow their desires to run rampant and let natural actions or reactions occur. History has recorded that there have been two kinds of people in this world, the good guys and the bad guys, just as anyone who's ever seen a grade B Hollywood movie knows. The bad guys are always looking for ways to destroy the good guys. Throughout history, they have hatched rotten plots to carry out their devious means. Whether it involves spiking someone's drink or taking advantage of the handicap, the bad guys don't care whose toes they step on in their selfish quest for power. Their target always has been, and always will be, naive youth. One of the tricks the forces of evil use is called the New Morality Game, devised by the self-proclaimed intellectual elite. This game works by telling young people that they are the most intelligent generation in the history of mankind, thus creating a generation gap. Hypnotic music creates an atmosphere where the unwary can be tempted to indulge themselves. The most important thing is to get this generation to be pleasure seekers. The youngsters may rebel at first because of the puritanical ethic of their middle class upbringing. But if you get them to take that first one, the rest comes easy. And for the more naive, there are those strange smelling cigarettes from below the border. Once you've got the youngster high, they will seek these kinds of experiences at every opportunity, creating a generation which is pleasure bent, self indulgent, or, as Dr. Timothy Leary says, a hedonistic society. This theme being promoted as the new morality over and over in the press, in the movies, on radio, on television, is designed to place a whole generation on one big orgy. And when they've indulged themselves to capacity, the bad guys will sock it to them. This time, the villains aren't going to settle for the heroine or a mortgage on the modest cottage. They're after real money and power. How far has this devious plot gone in this country? One wonders at some of the things going on around us. The increase of the use of narcotics in this country has alarmed many people. Sexual promiscuity, with the corresponding rise of venereal diseases, has been a cause for grave concern. And you can understand why when you see this baby born with syphilis. Racial tension has caused alarm. Who can forget the specter of Detroit and Watts? America is a problem-solving nation, accustomed to solving problems with immediate solutions. And the answer being presented today to all of these alarming problems facing our nation is sensitivity training. The cry comes up, is this just one more devious plot by the forces of evil to destroy good? Or is this the first step to a world of peace and utopia? Let's look at the facts. Sensitivity training has its roots in the conditioning experiments conducted by Ivan Pavlov, the Russian physiologist. Pavlov's famous experiments demonstrated how dogs were conditioned to salivate when a light was flashed on. What is less known is that Pavlov conducted the same kind of experiments with human beings, showing that human behavior could also be conditioned. The Russian communists found an immediate political use for this new scientific knowledge. They used Pavlov's conditioning principles as a means to control the mass. Through Bolshevik self-criticism, we will enforce the dictatorship of the proletariat, was the cry of the Communist Party. Americans learned just how well this communist technique worked during the Korean War. 
Never in the history of the United States Military Service has there been such a breakdown among captured prisoners. Major William E. Mayer, a medical doctor and psychiatrist for the Army who was responsible for interviewing Korean prisoners upon their return states, the Chinese couldn't have cared less what you talked about, really. It was the function of talking, because very rapidly other soldiers began to stop smiling and start listening. Very rapidly the soldier who was talking got the feeling that he had gone too far. He had exposed himself too much. So, when ten men would walk out of a self-criticism group, they would walk out in ten separate directions, divided like sticks in the Old Testament that you can break so easily when they are apart, but are so strong if they are together. After these well minds were made sick, the Red Chinese were able to have as few as six men guard six hundred American prisoners. For the first time, the U.S. fighting man did not try to escape his capture, and thirty percent, rather than face this bewildering experience, simply rolled over and died. If the Germans had used the same principle during World War II, there would be no such program as Hogan's Heroes on television. The loyalty and cooperation, the will to win that makes up the plot of the Saturday night television show was completely destroyed in Korea by the red Chinese version of sensitivity training. The few Hogan's heroes of Korea, those fighting men who had strong religious or moral convictions, were called hopeless reactionaries by the Chinese and were separated from the others and placed under heavy guard. Sensitivity training goes by many different names. Group dynamics, youth counseling, social engineering, Encounter, self-evaluation, human potential workshops, human relations lab, the games people play, group analysis, T-group training, attack in, interpersonal relations, management development, all are names for sensitivity training or brainwashing. Sensitivity training should never be confused with group therapy, which utilizes the strength of group interaction to help the individual rise above his problems. A good example of this beneficial therapy is the success of Alcoholics Anonymous. Ideally, this form of group therapy strengthens the individual and reinforces the convictions he already holds. This is why group therapy was popular in business and industry for leadership training, although this type of therapy is rapidly declining. Sensitivity training, or brainwashing, however, uses the group to criticize the individual's convictions and undermines them, if possible. In such a manner, it is possible through sensitivity training to subvert respect for parental authority, loyalty to country, religious and moral convictions, and the worth of the individual in making his own decisions. The present home base for sensitivity training in this country is the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, where group confession, self-awareness, touching, crawling in piles, nude marathons, shoulder dances, and other such programs are advocated as the answer to all of society's ills. Esalen would tax the imagination of even the most creative Hollywood writer. The intrigue involved with the strange mixture of government financing and Ford Foundation financing, to mention two, and the related endeavors with publishers of pornography, radical leftist groups, the Peace Corps, elementary and high schools, colleges, churches, and the Sexual Freedom League would amount to an endless supply of plots devious enough for Alfred Hitchcock. To the majority of American people, it's almost impossible to think that some behavioral scientists, psychiatrists, marriage counselors, psychologists, and clergymen really take these programs at Esalen seriously. But, as the old cliché goes, there is a method to their madness. That method is to convince the naive that they are nothing more than animals, to encourage the young and gullible to be over-aware of sensual feelings, and to create an animalistic response of self-indulgence. Noted authority, Dr. Hardin B. Jones, professor of physiology and medical physics at the University of California, tells us that sensitivity training leads to an animalistic mob response. Jones calls sensitivity training a powerful form of Pavlovian conditioning, conditioning by which sexual and emotional types of response can be substituted for intellectual consideration. To understand why this is so important, Let's use an example. Imagine yourself driving to work or to school. You're approaching an intersection and the light is red. Automatically, without thinking, you see the red light and your foot goes for the brake pedal. Your response is a conditioned reflex. Remember Pavlov and his dog experiments? Now, let's imagine the same situation. Only you reach the corner and the stop signal is out. 
you will react in one of two ways. If you're a sensible human being with the ability to reason, you would do the sensible thing. You would automatically step on the brake and come to a stop. But if you've been conditioned to have true animalistic response, you will keep your foot on the gas and try to go on through the intersection. How you respond in this situation depends on whether your subconscious alliance is to the Judeo-Christian ethic of the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or whether you will subconsciously revert to animalistic self-indulgence and self-concern. Why is this so important? Because if you subscribe to the Golden Rule, you will stop, wait your turn, and allow one another to pass in comparative order. The traffic situation will resolve itself. But if you respond as an animal, concerned only with self, and others are the same way, you will all charge into the intersection at the same time, creating chaos. And the only thing that can clear the streets and regain order is, of course, the policeman, or the police state. We have not yet reached the point where all will be chaos when the stoplights go out. But how much longer will it be before a majority is conditioned to believe that the self should replace the Almighty? Sensitivity training seeks to destroy the self-restrained individual man and replace this with the animalistic, self-indulgent response of the group. Thanks to the ability to communicate on a mass scale, fads can sweep this country at an alarming rate. And sensitivity training has been enjoying the Madison Avenue cure-all promotion that would have put medicine men to shame. Business jumped on the bandwagon to create the corporation man. But the PhDs, behavioral scientists, psychologists, and psychiatrists met their match in the profit and loss sheet. Business has taken another look at sensitivity training and all its aliases. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal bears this out with their headline, More Harm Than Good in Sensitivity Training. One example the article brings out tells about the executive who went to Esalen on his own hook and became so deeply affected by the experience that he quit his job. For a while, he worked as a dishwasher at Esalen. The article goes on to tell about another example, subheadlined, an executive breaks down. We quote, Now and then, a participant in sensitivity training will crack under the barrage of personal criticism and analysis. One big company in the Midwest stopped all sensitivity training after a vice president suffered a total breakdown during a session and had to enter a mental hospital. Fear of damage to the mental health of employees has taken other firms out of sensitivity training. Sensitivity, regardless of its obvious danger, is being promoted as the immediate solution to the alarming drug problem in the United States. Let's look at just one exaggerated example of how sensitivity training is being pushed. The March 21, 1969 issue of Life magazine is a classic example of slanted reporting designed to promote sensitivity training to life's more than 36 and one half million readers. In this issue, the highlight article was about the drug problem in Fort Bragg, California. A glowing report of Fort Bragg's sensitivity training and group confession is presented as the solution to the drug abuse problem. The article tells how two ex-drug users are given free run of Fort Bragg to establish a place called Awareness House. In unsupervised sensitivity sessions at Awareness House, young people who participate are told never to divulge what goes on. Only Life magazine is invited to view the proceedings. The Life article claims that 75% of the students at Fort Bragg High School were drug users. But the Awareness House staff itself admits that only 14% ever came to Awareness House. And they can't substantiate that even one of them has been completely cured. Thus, Life touts as a cure for all drug abuse everywhere a program which was tested only six months. A program which failed to reach 61% of the students who supposedly needed it. Life described Fort Bragg as a hard-drinking, dowdy, isolated community which hasn't changed since the 1800s. Suddenly, Life states, unbeknownst to parents or law enforcement agencies, that Fort Bragg was in the midst of an epidemic drug problem. Fort Bragg must have known something about the drug problem because Mendocino, a hippie haven of the Haight-Ashbury Berkeley caliber, is only ten miles away. But Life tells how only one of all 5,000 inhabitants of Fort Bragg was made aware of the problem and by the drug users themselves. That one person was a newcomer, an ex-newspaper man turned high school counselor by the name of Bryce Brooks. Brooks called in the two ex-drug addicts to start Awareness House, and the program was barely underway before someone called in Life magazine. Bryce Brooks has left his position at the Fort Bragg High School to direct a program financed by Robert Finch's Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. 
He will start programs similar to Awareness House throughout Northern California, subjecting more naive children to sensitivity training, conducted by those who have been considered from time immemorial the lowest outcast of society, the drug addict. All this, of course, is financed by you, the taxpayer. Could it be we've been had? Life magazine is a national institution, and life's articles are accepted as true and factual. This means that life can literally form the opinions of millions of Americans. But what the average American must realize is that Life magazine is controlled by a handful of editors. A rather scary thought when you consider how many people this handful can influence. As an example of how the news media and the press create opinion, George Leonard, a senior editor of Look magazine, has stated, Sensitivity training is the only thing that can save the world. When one considers the fact that Mr. Leonard also is vice president of Esalen Institute, it becomes obvious how one man's biased opinion can influence millions. Hopefully the general public and advertisers in these publications will take a penetrating look at the forces behind the editorial pages. The tremendous drop in revenue in advertising to these publications hopefully indicates the advertisers are becoming aware of this philosophy. It doesn't take a psychologist sociologist or educator to understand the part pornography plays in social ills plaguing the United States. Where is the courageous reporter to expose the unsolicited pornography going through the mails every day to teenagers? We are amazed to see the overwhelming increase of pornography through the mails, through music, and even advertising, where it would seem that on Madison Avenue, Fanny Hill has replaced Betty Furness. For an education in sodomy, incest, homosexuality, bestiality, masochism, pick up your newspaper and look at the films which are being shown at your neighborhood theaters. All of this is overlooked by the mass media as a contributing factor to the rise of promiscuity and the corresponding increase in venereal diseases. Instead, parents are portrayed as not having exercised their responsibility by teaching sex to their children. So now it becomes necessary for the government schools to provide sex education, which is based on the principles of sensitivity training, as the answer to this problem. Family life education encourages youngsters to write or talk about family experiences and discuss things which can only be classified as personal. To show how dangerous group confession can be and how it draws one into oneself, imagine yourself a teenage girl in a class on family life education, which is confessing teenage sex habits. Wanting to be part of the discussion, she confesses how she becomes sexually stimulated by being kissed and petted in a particular way. Can you imagine what she can expect from boys on future dates? Psychologists emphatically warn of the dangers of a lay person conducting such group encounters. Parents in Evanston, Illinois, bear this out with their description of the results of sensitivity. One mother said her daughter became hysterical. Others said their teenagers were unable to sleep. One boy reported that after an evening stint of blanket crawling and bread passing, he found himself on a street several blocks from his house at 3 a.m. with no recollection of even getting out of bed. Perhaps you can understand now why prominent psychologists like Dr. Everett L. Shostrom warn never participate in a group encounter with close associates. Never participate in a group that lacks formal connection with a professional on whom you can check, he says. Both these warnings went unheeded during sensitivity training sessions financed by the federal government for 36 Darien, Connecticut teachers. Leaders of the motel housed sessions encouraged and, yes, even demanded that the participants kiss, fondle, and stroke one another. And, of course, the trainers joined in, too. Absolutely no ground rules were established. Why were the sensitivity training sessions held? These 36 teachers were being prepared to teach sex education in the Darien schools. Perhaps you're thinking that we'll just never allow sensitivity training in our school. Are you sure that the masters of deception haven't sneaked it in already? A chat with your youngsters might prove enlightening. Any case of group confession or encouragement to discuss family problems, and you've had the course. You may become further enlightened by turning the subject to race relations. The same forces that have given parents the guilt complex necessary to accept sex education in the schools have been in work convincing young people that their parents are bigots. It has been almost impossible to pick up a magazine for the past several years without a race theme. Articles tell and retell about the alleged white, middle-class discrimination against all minority groups, especially the Negro. Television has made household words of Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael, Eldridge Cleaver, 
and has almost conferred sainthood upon Martin Luther King. The preponderance of these articles has created such a massive guilt complex that naturally the only answer to this dilemma is sensitivity training. Berkeley, California was the first community to feel the pangs of a collective guilt complex created by the news media. Here we see a wildly enthusiastic crowd of 10,000 whose guilt complex had led them into almost a masochistic frenzy to the point where, when Stokely Carmichael tells them how he is going to burn down white America, you can almost hear the masochistic screams of ecstasy, Hit me again, Stokely. Naturally, such a progressive community as Berkeley, with its overwhelming social conscience, would be the first to instigate cross-town busing to ensure racial balance. Supposedly, to avoid racial prejudice on the part of the Berkeley teachers, sensitivity training has become mandatory for all teachers, administrators, and classified employees of the Berkeley schools. They have to submit to sensitivity training or lose their jobs. Just think, with mandatory sensitivity training, maybe the whole country could be as progressive and beautiful as Berkeley. Is this really the only thing that can save the world, as expressed by George Leonard, the senior editor of Look Magazine? At this point, it should be made perfectly clear that only in a free society, such as the United States of America, can people sit around in the nude, confess their misgivings, and fondle one another if this is their desire. They can call it sensitivity training or anything else that happens to pop into their perverted minds. As long as they don't force their will on others, we as Americans have no argument with them. However, we do take issue with the small group of self-proclaimed intellectual elite who, it would appear, feel they alone are capable of guiding the destiny of the American people. A classic example of this is Otis Chandler, publisher of the Los Angeles Times, who in a meeting of stockholders of the Times, Mirror, made the following statement. A mass newspaper like the Los Angeles Times must remember that the preponderance of its subscribers have a basic interest in preserving the status quo, or they think they have. A mass newspaper, then, once it has begun slowly to grasp the dimensions of the problems of its society, can begin slowly to document them, to fulfill one of its primary purposes, which is to educate. I think this is the most difficult of all our roles, to educate, because more often than not we will be attempting it against the will of our subscribers. If his subscribers are so stupid they have to be educated, how can they be considered smart enough to purchase the products advertised in Mr. Chandler's newspaper? Every day of our lives, we Americans are encountering a form of sensitivity training or education. To understand this, think of yourself watching the news on television with your family or friends. Now consider the news commentator your group leader. He and his staff alone control what you will see from a single day's news events, and you are subject to his interpretation of these events. You are experiencing a form of coercive persuasion. If you reject the commentator's interpretation because of preconceived values, logic, or moral beliefs, you become subject to group criticism, and either you conform or you are branded an extremist. This thought control is the basis for the elusive middle-of-the-road philosophy, which means I'll accept anything that makes me safe from criticism. Television, with the ability to control the country's thoughts, can evoke an emotional response at will on any subject it wishes just by interpretation. How often have you seen a news event followed by a collective cry all over the country, there ought to be a law? And that's just what the government has done. Passed laws. And laws. And laws. And laws. What's happening is really very simple. In essence, it's the theory of the collectivist philosopher Hegel. Thesis, antithesis, to create synthesis. What does this mean to the average American? It means action and reaction to result in loss of liberty. For example, let's take a civil rights demonstration. The demonstration is the action or thesis. The outrage and indignation of the general public is the reaction or antithesis. When the public demands, why isn't something done, the laws that are passed by the federal government are the synthesis or the result of the action, reaction, which can result in the greater loss of liberty. For another example, let's take the problem of sexual promiscuity and venereal disease, which is the action. The concerned parent, seeking an immediate solution, reacts like most Americans, and is convinced that sex education in the school is necessary to solve these problems. The result is the federal government dictating the morals of our youth. The ultimate result is that the parent relinquishes his responsibility to nurture the moral principles which are the prerequisite of a free society. The state 
can now legally dictate morals, a prime requirement for a totalitarian state. What about drugs? This creates the action, the reaction you've already seen, a blind acceptance of sensitivity training sessions conducted by ex-drug addicts. The result? The ability of government exploiters through sensitivity training for ultimate thought control of the mass. It's certainly no secret that the pills the youngsters are using come from Mexico, that the marijuana they're smoking comes in from Mexico, and that heroin, too, is coming in from Mexico. It would seem logical to cut off aid to Mexico until they clean up this mess or subject people to search at the border in the same fashion we do with people coming in from overseas. Instead, our president is now proposing a law which gives government the power to break into your house in the middle of the night, if they like, without a warrant. Student rebellions probably serve as the best example of action-reaction. If you talk with the radical students, they will tell you that they are rebelling against the establishment and that they are rebelling for freedom. In reality, they are creating an emotional reaction by the general public which demands federal laws to control the rebellious students. So these campus dissidents are destroying the very thing the students are trying to gain. The ironic factor is that many of these radical student leaders are self-confessed communists, and communism is the greatest living example of the totalitarian state the world has ever known. But for some reason, this double standard is swept under the table by the communications media, who wear flak jackets and helmets to cover the activities of the love children. The most obvious example of action-reaction is an assassination, the action. The reaction is, there ought to be a law. This results in a proposed solution of registration and final confiscation of all firearms in the United States. These things have little meaning by themselves, but put them all together and they represent the makings of a total state or a totalitarian state. The difference between our country and Nazi Germany, communist Russia, or whatever these totalitarian states want to call themselves is simple. It is a matter of laws. The totalitarian state has thousands of laws to enforce the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Our country has very few laws because our country was founded on the Judeo-Christian ethic in God we trust, not in man we trust. Our forefathers designed a constitution based on individual self-restraint and based on the premise that government is to serve the people. Government powers were limited to protect the people from having evil men gain control of our nation by creating a strong central government. Two-thirds of the world today is ruled by a handful of men who use two simple methods to keep the masses in line, fear and force. The force is justified by laws and works very simply. Step out of line and you are shot. Fear is less obvious. It is accomplished by sensitivity training, defined here by collectivist Harry Overstreet. It is perfect because the individual has no real life outside the several collectives to which he belongs. And within any one of these, he can at any time, without warning, have his future put in jeopardy by having some fellow member accuse him of some deviation from the approved norm of behavior. What is at issue now is not the offense itself, but rather the manner of his response to group criticism. He is on the spot, alone. Thus, there is set going one of the strangest and most potentially destructive rituals ever devised. The lesson we as Americans must learn from the rise to power of these dictators is that it was the conspiring of the rich and the intellectual elite that brought the dictator to power, not the people. In the name of the people, in the name of the common good, they justify their wars, atrocities, deception, and cunning. Today, in this country, we are being told we have a sick, bigoted, over-materialistic society, and that for the common good, the government must take on the responsibility to feed the poor, eliminate discrimination, educate the children on sex, ensure housing for minorities, regulate finance, provide medical care, finance sensitivity training all in the name of the common good. Not too many years ago, a madman in Germany wrote a book called Mein Kampf, in which he told the world how, through the use of psychopolitics, now called sensitivity training, he could capture the minds of a generation of German youth, and with them, conquer the world. Nobody took him seriously. How many people today take seriously the anti-religious, humanistic forces at work in this country promoting sensitivity training? 
It took Hitler's youth informing on their parents to shock the world into realizing how successful were the ideas of this madman. But then it was too late. If the forces of evil are successful in this country, this child may never know freedom. May never know individualism. She may be in constant conflict with those who love and care for her. This child can be the tool to bring radical change to our form of government, to our family structure. Our Supreme Court has made it illegal to pray in the classroom. Rather, our young people are being educated about sex without morality, reaching for sensation without responsibility, so that when chaos is created by a handful of militants, they will react like animals. Or, if you will, when the stoplight goes out, it will be every man for himself. And out of the chaos that is created, the only thing that will restore order will be the inevitable police state.